Coming up, tribal citizens call for the restoration of the contaminated Clark Fork River in Montana. We visit with the Clinket and Denina at the Baskin writer from ABC's Alaska Daily, and all talks in Washington are on the debt ceiling. I'm Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start today in Arizona, where land protectors are celebrating a decision that puts a pause on destroying sacred land. The area under dispute is Oak Flat, located in southeastern Arizona. It is culturally significant to several western Apache nations. The U.S. Forest Service last week told a federal court it is not sure when an anticipated environmental impact statement would be approved for the proposed mining project. The statement was originally planned for this spring. Now the agency says it doesn't have a set timeline. Oak Flat sits atop the third largest deposit of copper ore in the world. Resolution Copper, a British-Australian company owned by Rio Tinto and BHP, has plans to possibly harvest 40 billion pounds of copper over the next 40 years. The pause came as good news to indigenous leaders who have tried to stop the mining through lawsuits and legislation in Congress. The Biden administration and the Forest Service say it will be using this time to further consult with the San Carlos Apache and other tribes that have voiced opposition to the project. Moving to France, native actors took over the red carpet and theater at a hot ticket event. Last week, Martin Scorsese's film Killers of the Flower Moon received a nine minute long standing ovation at the Cannes Film Festival. The high budget project follows the series of murders and theft over oil and land against the Osage Nation in the 1920s. Lily Gladstone, who plays the lead Molly Burkhart, was alongside her co-stars and Academy Award winner winning actors Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. Other cast members took over the red carpet, including Tantu Cardinal, Kara Jade Myers, Jillian Dion, and Janae Collins. Principal Chief of the Osage Nation, Jeffrey Standing Bear, was also in attendance and was consulted on the film. Chief Standing Bear said the Osage people suffered greatly and see the effects of the murders to this day, but this film has restored a trust that will not be betrayed. Killers of the Flower Moon will be in theaters in October. October. Well, a South Dakota surgeon has become the first Native American to summit Mount Everest. 36-year-old Lakota doctor Jacob Weasel conquered the mountain peak earlier this month in an effort to make history and raise funds for charity. The expedition aimed to raise over $175,000 to build a playground in his hometown of Rapid City and fund a women's health center in rural Nepal. Weasel has also successfully climbed a handful of of other notable mountains, including Mount Kilimanjaro, Rainier, and Cotopaxi. Everest, which stands at over 29,000 feet tall, is located in the Himalayan mountain range in southern Asia. In a statement, Weasel said he hopes the expedition serves as inspiration for Native kids to pursue their dreams. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast.
From 1957 to 2010, the Smurfit Stone Pulp Mill operated along the Clark Fork River in Montana. It left large amounts of pollution and leaked wastewater into the river. For decades, environmentalists and tribal leaders have called for the site to be cleaned up for the protection of the animals and people. Rachel Neal from the University of Montana School of Journalism took a deep dive into the ways this contamination has affected indigenous people. Take look. I remember when I was a child, uh, eight or nine years old, I was just up to my dad's chest and he took me fishing, which is something that we did often. And that day he took me fishing, we drove and we went across the river from the Smurfit stone site. And we cast our rods and I remember actually I caught a fish and I reeled it in and I was incredibly excited. Every kid remembers catching fish, right? It's such a, a central part of your childhood growing up, especially here in this part of Montana. And when we got the fish in, it was uh, soft, it was squishy, um, it was the wrong color. And of course, you know, being a child, I wanted to take it home. But my dad says, no, son, we, we can't take that home, that's sick. And so we had to, to put it back in the river. I asked my dad why that was and he, pointed across the river over at the mill site and he said, well, there's, there's a lot of contamination and pollutants and, and chemicals that come out of there and this just isn't a fish that we're gonna eat. That was an introduction to me that maybe this, this river that I grew up with thinking it was this incredibly pristine system, it had some challenges and it had some opportunities for improvement. The Clark Fork River is in the heart of our ancestral homeland. And for our Salish and Kalespe and Kasanka people, caretaking is a critical element for the tribes. So we take it very seriously as far as how the river condition is, how we can use it for subsistence, how it's uh, there for all the purposes that it's been created for since time immemorial. The river is important to us as a tribe. It's flowed through the heartland of our home for countless generations. We camped on the benches above the river. We hunted in the uplands. We caught fish from the river. Our life was, was good. The people were happy and contented. And we lived that way for tens of thousands of years. What we know is the river has changed and there's been profound change that has impacted fisheries, impacted our ability to gather plants that are foods and medicines. There is no clean, fresh water there. That's a great sadness to many of the elders. I grew up in the Missoula Valley and my dad used to take us on drives into the country and we would inevitably at times go around the Smurfit complex. The, the Smurfit mill was all lit up in constant big white plumes coming out that was catching to the eye, but then the smell was very sultry and it left a residue on your tongue. The challenges have been many. I mean, at the very beginning, the, f the first project manager on the site would often tell us that everything was good, that the mill did a really good job of protecting the environment while they were in operation. And we didn't feel that that, that was the case. It, it's taken many years to, to, to get an ear to listen to. A lot of those pollutants, those chemicals, the sludge ponds, the dump, they're all still there. And so, even though the site is no longer operating as a mill in the pulp mill, that pollution remains to this day. And that pollution continues to impact the waterway, the Clark Fork River. You don't get to go there anymore. So people that camped or had family history in that, in that reach of the river, or the Clark Fork, you lose that continuity of use. 
and language in experiential life history. So what does that do to your, your, your people? What does that do to your culture? Because how do you replace it? In 1855, the tribes negotiated the Treaty of Hellgate. And in that treaty, the tribes agreed to cede over 20 million acres of their Aboriginal territories, but they did that in exchange for certain guarantees. And one of those guarantees is written into Article 3 of our treaty. In that article, the tribes reserved for themselves the right to hunt, fish, and gather in all usual and accustomed places. When you talk about securing a, a treaty right for, for fishing, then the assumption is that fish would be safe to eat forever. The quality of the water would be good enough for the fish to survive. But most importantly, the, uh, the native people would be able to catch those fish, have access to get to them and catch them, and then they would be safe to eat. And so when you talk about chemical contaminants that might be in the fish tissue and how that lives on, you can't eat the fish anymore. It's not safe. Treaties are the most solemn obligations between nations. And the Hellgate Treaty of 1855 that we negotiated with the U.S. government provided access to fish. So not only is it a cultural obligation, it's also a legal obligation. And so if the tribes are going to continue their relationship with the land, that means that you need to be able to eat the fish. And if the tribes are not able to exercise that portion of their treaty, it represents a diminishment of the tribe's treaty rights. The tribes are very interested in, in trying to work with all of their partners to try to find a way to restore the site, but not only to physically restore the site, but to restore the tribe's relationship to that resource. You bring it back to the point before development. You bring it back to that condition. You remove any toxic soils. You you restore the plant community, you restore the ecosystem and the function of that riparian area, the water quality, everything. What we know is that rivers are resilient. If that damage can be cleaned up and restored in some way, then hopefully the river at some point can return to being resilient and, and repair itself. I think that what needs to happen is that the EPA needs to put their thumb down on the potentially responsible parties. I understand that the potentially responsible parties have much more funding and they can bring uh, powerful lawyers to the table, but I, I think that in the end, the Environmental Protection Agency should be protecting the environment and human health. So we'll be able to take people back to the Clark Fork, to a camp area, to be able to go fishing there and catch fish and uh, have that experience there. To set up your sweat house, to be able to do prayers, to be able to do um, whatever it is that that family or that clan would do in that site is, it's, um, it's priceless. To me personally, it's about reciprocity. One of the things that I was taught growing up is that you never take more than you give back. And we're talking about a river that has uh, provided for the Salish people for over 10,000 years. What a great opportunity to give back to the river. And I think that that's true, not only for me as a tribal member, but I think that that's true for so many of us who live here in Western Montana. I hope that it's fully restored. Maybe that we can camp along the riverbanks. Maybe that we can hunt in the area. Maybe there'll be food and medicinal plants that grow there, and maybe there'll be fish in the river. Maybe our kids will see that. We give a special thanks to the University of Montana's Journalism School for that report. Earlier this month, ABC announced it will not bring the TV show Alaska Daily back for a second season. The series, starring actress Hilary Swank, focused on reporters who investigate cold cases of missing and murdered Indigenous people. Vera Starbard was one of the Alaska Native staff writers on the show. I interviewed her recently to talk about the project. We got the news that Alaska Daily has been canceled, and I just want to jump in and ask what your thoughts were uh, when you first heard the news. Honestly, it was a bit expected. Um, I think when you're watching something that long and um, know 
uh, how ratings work, how, you know, how things are planned. Um, of course, you know, that we're really hoping it could be picked up, but uh, it, it had been a, a couple months that we were sort of getting just ready for the news that it would be canceled. So it wasn't really a surprise. Um, I think when we really realized it, it, it probably wouldn't be, we had already sort of set in motion that like preparing for the end. Can you tell us more about the role that you played on Alaska Daily? Yeah, as a staff writer, um, which just means I'm in the writer's room uh, helping with all of the writing, the ideas, the pitching, the storyline. Um, I wrote my uh, the episode 11, so which ended up being, at the time it was the season finale, and now we know it's the series finale. <laughs> Uh, so that was my episode, but, um, in between, you know, there's an awful lot that you're doing with the other episodes with, in my case, helping out an awful lot with, uh, the, the native stuff, the connecting and, um, costumes and props. And I think I had a fast line to the costume department and the props department, uh, cause it was about Alaska and there were, two of us originally that were Alaska native and um, about uh, around the third episode, they hired a third to be actually on set, uh, Peter Blanchett. So it was myself and Andrew McLean in the writer's room and then Peter Blanchett on set. The series follows a reporter who is um, essentially uncovering and investigating a story about missing and murdered indigenous women. How did you take what is a real life crisis and make it into a drama that non-Native people can really learn from? Yeah, some of it was an understanding that the audience primarily wouldn't know that this was a crisis. It's something that in the Native communities we're very familiar with. We march about, we talk about, we try and change. It's It's a really commonly known cause and it's sort of continually surprising to me how little most people know about native culture, native peoples. Um, so starting from that kind of baseline, but we also knew people would know there, there has been some media around it. Um, so how can we be different about that? Like uh, a lot of the previous sort of media, uh, fictional media, I should say around it, kind of focused just on the crime. Um, how could we really show that this is uh, a foundational thing in, in so many places, that this is uh, something that's institutionalized. It's institutional problems. Um, how can we give focus to different areas of that? So many of the episodes, it was sort of which facet of why this is a problem can we focus on? Because it wasn't about just finding one guy who may have murdered, murdered one indigenous woman. It was so much bigger than that. and. Ultimately, that's what the two reporters actually talk about when the killer is sort of finally caught. They say, why does this feel so empty? Like, this this isn't about this one person. This is about so much bigger. And they really hone in on the system and the systemic problems. I'm really curious if you can talk about um, the acting by Grace Dove and Irene Bedard alongside, you know, Hillary Swank that so many Americans just know like the back of their hand. Yeah, Grace Dove, her character and how she portrayed it, like, that's why I signed up for the show. Um, I had the advantage of being able to see the pilot uh, before I talked to the producers. And uh, to be honest, the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women made me cautious to sign on for the show because I've seen how that can be mishandled. But I hadn't seen a character like... Roz Friendly, what, who Grace uh, portrays. And she really brought this strength to it that I was like, okay, I wanna be part of that. <laughs> I wanna help bring that to people. I want to uh, help people see real native woman, um, a, a native character who <laughs> isn't content with sort of taking this Tonto sidekick uh, kind of idea of, what she should be doing and pushes for more and says, I'm not going to be your tonto. Um, <laughs> and confession. So Irene Bedard is my sister-in-law. <laughs> she actually 
um, she introduced me to my husband, her brother. So um, I've known her for many years now. And while I still believe her introducing me to my husband was the best thing she ever did, I think the second best thing she ever does, she's just a, a wonderful, wonderful actress. And she brings it for every second she's on stage. There was a moment in uh, the episode I wrote where she didn't have any dialogue. She was um, at the very end, there's a ceremony and it's maybe 20, 30 seconds of her on screen. And she had everyone on set just choking back tears uh, without any dialogue. Like that's the kind of powerful actress she is. I have to ask uh, what is next for you and the projects that you're taking on? I do have some things next. Um, however, we're in the middle of a strike. <laughs> Um, so those things are all quite literally on hold. Um, and we'll see sort of once, once the studios make those deals and actually negotiate, we'll get back to them. I do hope to, to be back with some pretty good news, <laughs> um, later, uh, to be able to talk about those a little bit more openly. Um, I, I still have, I'm a playwright. I'm a magazine editor. I write for animation. Um, but yeah, I do have some some exciting things, not to be like a total tease about it. But yeah, I, I, I think Native people will be really happy with what comes next. Well, Vera, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. All right. Good luck, Tish. All anyone can talk about in Washington, D.C. is the negotiations on the debt ceiling. The Treasury Department says legislation needs to be passed before June 5th to avoid an economic disaster. ICT regular contributor Holly cook Macaro is back with us today. She's a partner with Spirit Rock Consulting and a board member of Indige Public Media, the parent company that owns ICT and the ICT Newscast. Welcome back, Holly. Hi, Aaliyah. President Biden and Speaker McCarthy reached a deal over the weekend. What are the latest updates on it as of Wednesday morning? Well, the um, we saw a, a lot of action over the weekend, as you said, the Memorial Holiday Week, Memorial Day holiday weekend. And um, as the Congress reconvened yesterday, returning early from their Memorial Day recess, they um, immediately went into um, consideration by the House Rules Committee and of the debt ceiling bill. And there's been lots of uh, machination back and forth on both sides of the aisle, really on the Republican side, when you're in the majority in the House, it really is your responsibility to take the lead on passing this bill. So McCarthy has put together the deal along with President Biden, which was a bit of a victory for him. President Biden had said he wasn't going to negotiate on the debt ceiling bill. He wasn't going to ne negotiate budget items. So McCarthy bringing Biden to the table on that was a bit of an initial victory. I think um, the consideration in the House Rules Committee, which like I said, is some legislative minutia, but it really is where a lot of um, the work on how this bill is going to be considered gets done. Critically, and a note for Indian Country, Tom Cole chairs that committee and um, a member of the Chickasaw Nation. He is a very senior Republican. Uh, so seeing him manage this bill is is um, a, always a great thing. He's such a terrific advocate. Now, in managing this bill, the bill passed out of the committee on, on a seven to six vote, very close, but it gives us an idea of the fractious Republican caucus that Speaker McCarthy is dealing with and what he's going to deal with when the bill comes to the floor later on this evening around 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Speaking about the deal, are you seeing any major sticking points that involve Indian country in it? Uh, there are sticking points, but I actually think Indian country fared pretty well in this deal. Um, first and foremost, it's the protection of the advance appropriations for the Indian Health Service. This was the this in in and of itself advance appropriations for the IHS was a huge and long fought victory for Indian country that um, was finally passed by the last Congress and put into place. So to see it protected in the debt ceiling legislation alongside funding for veterans um, programs 
um, just kind of hit you right in the heart in terms of of the work and all the advocacy that's been done. There, there's a section on there with a limitation on advanced appropriations, two exceptions, funding for veterans, funding for the Indian Health Service. Um, the I will put an asterisk on that because that funding is flat uh, for the first two years and then with an option for two more years or for a waiver in the last two years. So when you have flat funding in the IHS, it's really, really is a cut be, because of inflation. Um, but the fact that we have advanced appropriations and it was protected, that is a victory. There are other pieces in there. We're going to see some cuts across the board um, that um, that is affecting all of the budget. Uh, I spent a ton of time yesterday, as did many other tribal advocates and tribal leaders, looking through all of those accounts that were listed um, that we we're calling them the rescissions accounts from the CARES bill and the ARPA legislation, all of those that put the historic funding into Indian country. Again, I think the tribal funding has been preserved. A couple of accounts that had been lightly utilized by tribes, but all in all the tribal programs uh, were protected. There are on a policy level concerns about uh, the rollback of some of the NEPA provisions and what those provide to Indian country, the opportunity for tribal consultation, et cetera. It remains to be seen how those will, will be ultimately implemented. Well, Holly cook Macaro, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaliyah. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.